Okay, we're off and recording. So for today, um, for our last session of the series that we've been doing on LLMs, I'm going to talk about setting up for a RAG um, or Retrieval Augmented Generation. And so here I'll show what I developed first, and then we'll talk through the code of it. Um, so this is running on Hugging Face. Um, which is just a great resource for running something like this. I'll try to make it a little bigger. So it's basically just a chatbot. And for this, it's related to a topic called needs assessment that I do work on. And so um, what is need? How is it different from a want? Then I hit submit. Um, so it's currently using the Gemini model in the background, and you'll see all that. Um, and then I have it set up so it responds. It responds out of documents, and then it tells you what the lead source document for that. And later I'll show you kind of how it does that and the pros and the cons and why that might be a little deceptive. Um, but yeah, it's a basic chatbot using RAG. I have files in it and it just runs here. And then- um, Ryan, are you sharing your screen? Oh, did I not hit share screen? Oh, maybe I didn't hit share screen, sorry. Now I'm sharing the screen, right? Uh, question. Yeah. How did you set up a rag with Gemini running in the background? That's what you'll see momentarily on yes, okay. all the code. Um, so, let me pull these off to the sides. Um, sorry, the Zoom stuff is over mine. So yeah, this is like the user interface. So if you develop anything on Hugging Face, your app, you name a file app.py and that becomes the application. Um, and so this is like where you can see it. And then you can export that or iframe it into other pages. So it actually runs on a page that I run called needsassessment.org. It's the meet with like ask expert. This is there, um, but it runs all here. So it's just like a um, iframe to get it there. And then here are all the files that run it. And all these are available. So um, I can post the link at the end and you can see any of this, it's all public. So, just to give you an overview of the file structures. So um, this is one of the files. This is a book, um, then a couple other books and articles. In total, I'm running five different files that are going into the RAG. Um, they're all PDFs. They wouldn't have to be, but that's what I'm running with. And I'll show you in the code what other things I could run with. Um, but I just put them here. I could put them into subfolders and organize them in different ways. But for this, I just took five files. It's about a thousand pages of PDF probably in total, something like that. Um, then this is the actual application file that we'll look at app.py. Um, you can ignore these pickle files that was from an earlier attempt and I'm not using that anymore. So we'll jump right into the code though, which is where it gets interesting. Um, so I made this using these tutorials that are listed at the top. And again, everything will be public so you can go and see any of this and copy and paste. But usually when I do things now, I, I put on the tutorials I go to at the top so I can quickly get back to them. Um, and of course I load a whole bunch of libraries. Some of these I could probably take out because I may not have ended up using them, but I'll have to go back and clean up everything at some point and see which ones I'm actually using and which ones I'm not. Oh, I guess one other file I will show that is kind of important to it. Um, there is a requirements file. So these are the things that are not typically loaded onto Hugging Face that I had to load on. Um, so every time it starts up, the first thing it does is it pulls all these when it starts up a new kernel and it puts all these onto them. Um, so it's kind of a summary of the packages, but there are a few packages that it has built in that are also gonna be in use. And that just sits there. Um, 
So here we go. So it uses a lot of Langchain, um, which is just very convenient for doing many of these things. You wouldn't have to use Langchain, but you would have to write a lot more code. Um, and there are a couple of competitors, I guess, now to Langchain, but it's kind of a standard, it seems. Uh, we did an earlier session on Langchain, I think, late last spring, maybe even. Um, so these are the API keys. Um, I played with it on OpenAI too, so I have my key there, and I have a hugging face key. And I'll talk about Cohere, which is another AI company that um, they do have a tool that I can use here, and it's free, so I may or may not use it in this. Um, so, but you have to have an API key. So those are all stored. Um, if you want to do something in Hugging Face like this, I guess I can show this too. In, so in with all of your files, you have settings. And in your settings, you can store your secrets. And so that way you don't have to have them. And then, so I'm just pulling that out of my settings to say, in my OS environment, then these are my secret keys so that I don't have to have them here. Um, but it's real easy. You just go into settings. It's like the third menu down. You click it, and then you just put in and name your key, whatever you want to name it. Um, so this is just some setup stuff. Um, this first part here is about the user interface um, that we just saw on the other. I won't go through it. I just copied and pasted it from someone else. I said, oh, that's a nice looking chatbot interface. Um, it uses something called, um, begin, oh, there it is, Gradio. And I don't know, that's what people say. Like if you're running a user interface on Hugging Face, this is the easiest one to work with. And it is really easy. I didn't have to make many changes. Um, but that's really just the interface and not the more interesting LLM part. So. OK, so the first set of functions are to get the documents and to um, load them in. So as I said, I just am pulling in PDF documents. Um, but with the tutorial that I pulled to get this part of it, they had it for CSV documents um, or Word documents, dot, doc, doc, X ones. Um, I put those into green, like they're just not loading right now, but I left them all there in case I decide I want to add a Word document or a CSV file. But everything I had was PDF, um, which basically just loads it as a blob. It's probably not the best way to do it. As we saw in the talk two weeks ago, when they were talking about their RAG system, they use a much more sophisticated way to get PDFs so that if you have a lot of tables and things, you can use that. Um, it's just another package that does that for you. It'll load your PDFs in a different way. This one's pretty direct though. It just takes what it has and puts it in as a glob and loads it up for you from there. So yeah, that's how I bring in the files and I return them as documents. Nothing too exciting about it. Um, then we have to chunk those in order to create the vectors. Um, so I guess one critical thing of understanding that a lot of people, I think, get confused around with the RAG, with doing this with LLMs, um, is that it really breaks the document down into a lot of chunks. And each of those chunks is represented separately. So there's no like interplay between the chunks. So like if your query, so let's say we have a document and it is 10 pages long and we break it into a hundred chunks. So a 10th of a page is each chunk. Each of those gets a vector assigned to it. And then when you do a query, a vector gets assigned to your query and it says, okay, we have a query that is num, let's, I'll just say some number. It's like 22, 33, 44. Which of those hundred chunks has a number that's close to that? And it uses typically cosine similarity, though you could use others. 
and it will find, and you can say like, I want the five chunks that are closest to my query. It will only bring back those five chunks out of the PDF. And they could, it could cut off right before it gets really interesting. Like, so your chunking really matters. Mm -hmm. Like, so if you have a paragraph and it gets broken into five chunks, it may pull out the first two chunks, which are the first two sentences, but not pull out the last three, which might be where the more interesting part is. And there isn't really that much out there on chunking. And so how I kind of think of it is like, so with this one, I'm chunking every 1500. Um, so it's splitting the text at every 1500 characters. Um, so I'm chunking at that size, which is pretty big. Like if it was an FAQs document. So like if you were working for a company and you had FAQ documents that you wanted the chatbot to use, you might want a fairly small chunk because each FAQ is kind of its own piece mm -hmm. of information. So you'd probably want to study your documents and see like, oh, well, our average FAQ is 200 characters long. So I want to chunk, let's say at 220, so I get the whole chunk. Um, and then you can also do how much overlap you want between chunks. So do you want it really to cut at 1500 or do you want it to cut, like here I'm doing at 1500 with 200 overlap. So really it's doing like 1700 to get that 200 overlap. And so you're getting some overlap. And again, that's useful because I have text that's written paragraphs. And I was afraid of that issue of, well, I might cut a chunk right at a good point, and then there wouldn't be important parts would get left out. And last week I was reading an article around chunking because there's very little written about this. And they were talking, there are kind of four ways that you can do chunking now. This is kind of just like straight set a number, that's it. There's also recursive chunking where it goes back and it tries to make sure that all the chunks are about the same. And I don't quite understand how that works, um, but it described it pretty well. Then there's semantic chunking where it's more complicated, it actually tries to base things around meaning. Um, and then there's document specific chunking where you try to chunk like on the paragraphs. So you might say like, I want it at the paragraph or you might say you want it even like at the section level so you would have a big chunk at each section of the document. Um, so you can chunk in many ways. There's a link to the article kind of at the end of this um, call out piece here that if you're interested kind of in what is going on and the ideas around how do we chunk. Um, I'm sure it's gonna get more interesting and more complicated going forward, but people haven't really explored it all that much. And you have to have the same chunking for all documents? No, I don't think so. You would just have to, you would kind of create different vectors for each of them. Yeah, you could do it separately for each. Um, but for this, I just put them all into one, made it kind of like one PDF and then just chunked it into mm -hmm. chunks of 1500, which seems, um, and I'm sure someone will write software that will allow it to do like, It'll test it at a hundred, five hundred, a thousand, fifteen, and then you can compare against the results and see like which gave you better result. But I haven't seen anything like that yet. But it only makes sense that you would have to have a streamlined way for figuring out what is the right chunk size, because it really does impact on what types of results you get. Um, as you could imagine, again, if you were doing an FAQ document and you had really big chunks you're pulling a lot of non-essential information into your returns every time, um, which has some challenges both in like the quality of the response, but there's quite a bit written around how when you have more in the context window, the LLMs tend to pay more attention at the beginning, at the end, and things in the middle get lost, which I guess is kind of like humans in that like, we have primacy effect where we know we remember things better if they're more recent. And sometimes we remember like the first time something happens more than 
the 25th time that it happened. So some things might get lost if you end up putting too much extraneous information into your context window. Does that make sense to everyone online too? Yeah, that's good. I So as I look at that, I, I think what I'm looking at is you're setting aside a string with a maximum number of 1,500 characters with a possible um, 200 character overlap, or not a possible, but a 200 character overlap. And then you are setting um, line separators. So I, I, I think um, I'm looking at double new line, new line, space, yep. uh, no space. So... Um, it's not that the, the the chunks are 1500 characters it's that's the maximum correct or am yeah. I misinterpreting yeah yeah I guess no you're correct it's the maximum that they would get to um and so do, do the separators have... get into the text splitting too yep do you have some sort of sense of uh the variance in in, in the actual chunk sizes because uh or or maybe um maybe the question I'm actually getting at is um is there a limitation with a uh, um, a, a minimum chunk size. Uh, you know, how do how do we know that the chunk sizes aren't inadvertently being set to twenty because that's where we hit a separation character? Let's see. I think I have it set so that it prints some of that out. Oh, but... yeah. So here I have it. Uh, no, I don't have it set there. This is about the tokenization of it. Um, so I do have, I guess I could break it down further. I did have it tell me how many total chunks. So it made 1,084 total chunks out of my documents. Um, but within this, yeah, you could tell it to tell you what size chunks you were using. Um, it's pretty flexible in that it'll give you whatever information you really want from it. Did you have your like uh, summary statistics there of 50% uh, tracking the loss? So, oh, there you go. yeah, so whenever you restart it, like whenever I update the file, it reloads everything. And then I have some of the stuff logged at the very top when it does it. 25% file. Oh, those are chunk sizes. Number of tokens. Well, yeah, that's with number of tokens as it goes through each of the five documents. Um. But token size is going to be a little different than chunk size. So, but I assume that I could probably either write something or find something where someone has added that to their script where it tells them what their chunking turned out like. So you can plot that too. Yeah, yeah that would I, be I, I, I'm going to give that a try once I steal your code, Ryan. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, because text splitter is a fairly common thing for NLP tools. Um, but I think it's interesting with this application that there hasn't been more thought put into this. It seems really critical to me, like how you break those documents apart is gonna have a big impact on the type of results you're getting out of it. Um, question. Yep. So which um, generative AI tool you ended up using for your final product? Uh, was it uh, Gemini or um, OpenAI's model? So I'll, you'll see in just a minute. So for the tokenization, I used ChatGPT's 3.5 Turbo. Um, I don't know. It was there. It was already set up. And tokenizing really cost you almost nothing. Um, so I just have it go to my API. It's like less than a penny's worth of work to tokenize a document. That's not where they charge you that much. Um, but you could also use um, Hugging Face has a tokenizing model too that you could plug into that. So this is the model there with right here on the tokenization. And then down here is just the code saying, like, tell me what's happening with the tokenization. Um, so easy process. It's taking all of those chunks then and turning them into chunks of tokens rather than just chunks of plain text. Um, and as far as I know, you can go between any of the models with tokens, like tokenizing from ChatGPT and using it and Llama or losing it and Gemini doesn't matter. 
they don't have like their own tokens, but they all have their own token generators, it seems, um, for tokenizing the text. So then we, I have to, so now I have the text, I have it in chunks and I've broken this from plain text into tokenized text because LLMs work with tokens, not plain text. And now we have to embed that into vectors and then save those vectors someplace. So we're gonna want a vector for each of those chunks of text. So I have 1,084 chunks, so I should end up with 1,084 vectors. So first I'll create those vectors and then I'll have to store those vectors. Um, so now for this, actually I'm using the hugging face model to create the embeddings or the vectors out of those chunks of text. As you can see though, again, with the stuff I borrowed, they had it set up so I could have selected Google I could have selected a open AI to make the embeddings. Um, Hugging Face does it for free. So I was like, oh, I'll use the free one. Again, I, open AI, when I've done this before, it's a thousand pages was like 30 cents. So it's not ridiculously expensive to use theirs, but I'm pretty cheap. So I was like, oh, Hugging Face will give me the exact same thing for free. Um, and now I do think though, Part of that decision, I'm not sure how that plays in with um, using other systems for other parts of the LM. And it all seems to work fine, but there probably is something to using the same embedding ones, maybe to using the same LLM model to pull from then. I don't know. It works fine, but maybe I get slightly better performance if I used a hugging face embedding model and a hugging face LLM because somewhere in there it's changing my query into a vector, but it's not the same software that created the original vector. Um, though my doubt, my experience is it doesn't really make a difference. It still works. It's maybe you would get a small nudge in performance, um, but I could try that out too, because again, Kind of, you can use any of them you want. You can borrow and steal from my code or from others. So this is going to use the hugging face model. Um, it will take all of those chunks that have been tokenized and make them into vectors. Um, and that's all it does. How are you evaluating performance, just qualitatively based on? Qualitatively based on how well it works <laughs> okay. for me, getting answers I like. Yeah, um, yeah. I haven't gone to use what is it, Ragus, which is an, one of the tools that they presented on two weeks ago around another performance tool um, for RAG systems specifically. Do, do you compare it against like GPT-4 just to see, you know, anecdotally, if you're getting better answers than what you would just get mm -hmm. from, you know, chat GPT? Well, specifically for this, um, only allowing it really to pull out of those five documents. Um, so yeah, if I just go to chat GPT, it's not pulling from that. It's just kind of pulling from the universe. And I'm telling it to pull from these five documents. And that's kind of what I'm judging its performance on. Like, again, I know this literature because I wrote one of the books and I was an editor for one of the other books that was in there. So. I know what the answer should be. And is it giving me that answer? I can kind of tell pretty quick. Um, but yeah, you could challenge it against others, but again, they wouldn't be doing rags. So who knows where they're getting their information from. Now, if they're giving you the same answer from the general that you're getting out of rag, then you probably don't have to do rag because there's nothing unique in your rag documents, obviously. Um, so thanks for joining us. <laughs> Okay, so now we've taken our text, we've chunked it, we've turned that into tokens, and now we've created vectors out of those. So now we have to store those vectors somewhere. So we have all these numbers. So we have a thousand chunks that were turned into vectors, and we're then gonna create a vector store to hold those. Um, there are many vector stores, well, not many. There are a handful of vector stores available. Pretty much everyone seems to use Chroma. I don't know what the difference would be and why you would choose another 
but maybe there is for different types of data, maybe it can get data more quickly in another database system. But Chroma databases are really good at this, it appears. Um, is so this- Is that a type of database or is that like a specific cloud storage platform? So my understanding is a type of database, but it's built, my understanding is off of MySQL. So, but I don't know too much about like what makes it different than just a MySQL database. Um, but it is, at least my understanding is it is designed to hold vectors and not other types of information. And then it can retrieve those vectors really fast out of it. But I don't know, again, why it does that or how it does that. Um, and there are, I think, four or five others that people talk about. But it seems like most everyone just uses this. And maybe this is like the open source one. Um, Maybe David knows an answer to that if Chrome is an open source project. Um, so yeah, it just creates the database here and says that we call that our vector store. Um, and now what we have to do is um, within that vector store, then I have to create some place to hold my embeddings because it's just like a blank database. Um, so basically here I'm creating within my vector store, a place where I'm gonna put all of them. And I'm calling that all hugging face embeddings is the name of that vector store. Um, so now I have a nice place to hold all of this, all these vectors that I've been creating. And then I'm gonna go ahead and create it. And so now at this point in the text, or in the code, I have actually that database of vectors. So my 1,084 chunks, I have 1,084 places on in my database. Um, it's not the pizza, by the way. <laughs> so JP must have forgotten the order. Um, it's now storing these vectors for all of those chunks, and they're just kind of hanging out there. And now what I have to do is retrieve from there when people make queries. So I have to have a way of retrieving from that to say, this query has a vector of such and such. Now I want to retrieve all of the ones, whatever K value I want for that, of ones that would be similar to that. Um, so here I'm doing it by similarity, which is cosine similarity. And I'm bringing back 10 um, and I'm not setting any threshold like that it has to be 80% similar or anything. I'm just saying whatever the top 10 are, those are the 10 I want you to bring back for me. Um, so it's interesting. And one reason I'm glad I did the project was I never thought too much like about the retrieving mechanisms. And I'll go through some more code to kind of say like, how you can customize the retrieval and think about it in different ways, which may be applicable um, as you build. So you really, I think by doing even just projects like this, where, I don't know, no one will probably use this other than me and maybe like 10 people who visit my site sometime, but it really helps you understand kind of how a system is working and breaking things apart. That kind of gets glossed over and then people are like, oh, the ChatGPT read the document and told me this was the most important thing. It's like, well, no, that's not actually what it did. It did something, but it wasn't quite that. Um, yeah, so this is the beginning of the retrieval then. Um, and so it will bring back those 10 top scores by cosine similarity of my query vector versus all the other 1,084 vectors I put into there, um, which isn't that many, so it can run pretty fast. But this was, again, the part that I thought was really interesting. So this tutorial was talking about um, kind of then doing compressions on what you bring back. So yep, if you think about it, I could just take those 10 vectors and the chunks that go with them 
and dump those chunks into my context window and have the LLM use that as the context window. But that may not be the most efficient way to get information to the LLM because I'm basically taking chunks of different sizes up to 1500 and just tossing them in. Um, so you can compress and do other things with those. You can send them to LLMs to create other summaries and put that into the window. You can do a lot of different things with that chunk of information to make it more useful to your LLM so that it can potentially give you better results. So you'd wanna play a lot with these things to see kind of like, what is the best way to then feed that information into the context window rather than just dumping it in as 10 chunks of data for it to look at. Um, so one of the things then we did was, um, it has, so I put in there, I want to break up each of those chunks then into smaller chunks. And I'm going to try to pull out just the smaller chunks. So instead of having the 1500 character, let's say I had a chunk of 1500, can I break it into three and then decide which of those three smaller pieces actually is the piece of information that I want the LLM to use? So again, I'm kind of doing a, I'm actually am doing a splitter and I'm trying to split those apart again. So up here, you can see I set it to be chunks of 500 and I set the K at 16. And so I'm starting to break apart all of my chunks. And then using a package that is built in then to Langchain, you can actually look for redundancies. So it'll go through and remove any redundancies of those smaller chunks. So I've taken my 10 and let's say I broke them into 30. It'll again go through the 30 and say, are any of these 30 duplicate? And if so, toss it because we already have that information. So that's like one easy way of compressing down what you're gonna put into the context window. Um, and then you can do the similarity match again then on what you have left. So now I can do the same similarity match that I did to get my 10, but I can do it on my new 30 and bring back, let's say 10 of those so that I've kind of minimalized the amount of information I'm pulling over. Um, and then I bring that in. So I'm bringing in less information than I would have otherwise. Um, and that's what they call this compression retriever in this tutorial, but it's kind of compressing down what information you're bringing over. Um, yeah. Now, there was another tutorial where they actually just use LLMs to do this. They took each of the chunks and they sent it to an LLM and kind of said, summarize this and just bring me back like, a sort summary instead of the whole chunk, and then just put that into it. So there's many ways you could do this. And this is then where this Cohere re-ranker came into discussion. And I have it in green. Um, it works, but I just turned it off and I never turned it back on. And what it does is it actually uses the Cohere AI to re-rank your smaller chunks. So in what it's trying to do, so you pass the query and you pass your chunks and it puts them into a new order, which people seem to think the ordering matters in the context window. And so by having it reordered, then you're more likely to get the LLM to respond in a way that you want. I didn't see like practical changes, the answers were, pretty much the same, whether I had it turned on or had it turned off. But I could see it being useful, especially if you had like, bringing back a lot of chunks. Like if you, I'm a thousand pages of PDF, that isn't that much for a RAG system. But if I had like all of the policies of a company, which could be thousands of pages, you could end up bringing back a lot of chunks and then getting those into the right order so that the LLM knows where to prioritize could be important for a large task like that. And that's what their re-ranker 
system does. And they let you access it, it seems, for free through there. But they have, they're an LLM company. So you can use their LLM and stuff too. They sell a lot of different products. Um, and there are probably other re-rankers out there. And again, this is just something I had not thought of until I really broke back, broke out this retrieval process was what is it that I really want to put into my context window and what order do I want it? We're all kind of decisions I had been overlooking. I'd just been dumping stuff in and that wasn't as effective. Um, so all of that is what we've gone through now just to create what's gonna go into the context window. And now we actually have to start the actual LLM that's then to use any of this information. Um, so this is where I'll initiate the LLM. Um, so I have two that I have initiated here. Uh, actually, I initiate all three, the Hugging Face, the Google, and the OpenAI. And I have them all set at the same temperature. Um, not all of them use top P. I think um, Hugging Face uses top P, but OpenAI doesn't. Um, oh, no, they do. I have to pass it here. So I'm passing it as a variable. So yeah, this is just setting that up. It's just a function to do that. Um, now with Google, they have safety settings. And this is true of their prior model and that came back in with the pro model to the Gemini model, where you can set what types of things you want to filter out for, um, which for a lot of projects would be useful. OpenAI kind of does this for you on the back end, but you don't know how they're doing it and you have no control over it. So I kind of like that Google lets you choose if you want to filter out for different things. For this, I have them all set as block none. Um, because for some odd reason, even though this is only about the topic of needs assessment, it kept coming up as hate speech and blocking. You would get an error in the log file and it's like blocked for hate speech. And I'm like, what about needs and needs assessment is hate speech? I have no idea. So I just blocked everything to none and it works and it hasn't given me any problems. Ryan, but if can, were, can I, can I ask? Students would probably really want to think about blocking some things. Okay, sorry. Yes, oh, ma'am. Yeah, I, I was just uh, confused about exactly why you're specifying multiple providers here. Oh, I wouldn't have to. I could turn any any of the ones I'm not using off. Um, I did use Hugging Face earlier, though, for the embedding. So that's probably why I have it on. Um, but I'm not using OpenAI at all, so I could turn it off. I copied this code out of someone's tutorial. So I don't know. I turned okay. it off a all bunch right. of stuff. I added stuff. It didn't have the safety settings part in there, so I added that. Relating to the safety settings, like, uh, do you remember uh, Abigail Haddad? She presented in the fall. Um, oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, so she, yeah. on LinkedIn, she's been going, she's been on a bit of a a, a rant about uh, about rags recently. And, and she posts all kinds of examples about where they fail and stuff. So one interesting example recently was like, where it was like supposed to be some sort of, FAQ for a church, but then suddenly the rag started imagining that it was uh, a priest and was giving, <laughs> was administering confession. And so uh, that would be bad. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, so like, uh, so she confessed her sin of saying that she didn't like rags that much. And, and then, and then uh, the penance was something like, you know, to our fathers or something like that. Anyway, so uh, I guess I'm just, my question is just with these things, is there a way, are there ways to sort of, I don't know, filter the inter interaction or guide the interaction so that, you know, cause people aren't always going to interact. I mean, in this case, it's, it's people who are interested in your book or your research, but what if it's a broader audience, you know, can, cause people don't always, you know, interact with your, your rag in the way that you think that they're, they're going to. Yeah, and you'll see later, it's part of my prompt that I actually add to everything. Um, I have in there that if it's not about needs assessments, then don't answer it and just say, I can only answer questions about needs assessment. 
otherwise people could just use it as like a general Gemini model and ask any question that they want of it. And it does a pretty good job of that. Um, but that doesn't mean someone won't figure their way around. I would also say that for something like an FAQs, RAG, chatbot type thing, you would set your temperatures pretty low to keep pretty tight constraints on what it's going to try to do. If you move that temperature up, the LLM will put in a lot of things that you won't have any idea why it's doing it. Um, so yeah, anywhere from like a 0.5 to like a 0.6 or 7 will keep fairly tight constraints on what it's going to do. Um, but if it was really specific, you could even drop it down to like a 0.1 and it would just give you what's out of the RAG document basically. But it wouldn't have very much interest then. It wouldn't like tell longer pieces if people had questions. It will really limit it down. You can also limit how much, how many tokens it's allowed to give back. So if you wanted to limit it down to just like yes, no questions, you could really limit it down. Say like the output token count can only be a max of five tokens and then it can't go past that boundary. So it's only then to give you minimum information. So I think there are probably ways you could, it would depend on what your use case was and what you're trying to accomplish. That answered my question, thank you. So another thing that you'll find out when you do RAG is that um, since you're doing API calls, it doesn't have a history memory like your, if you go through the chatbot interface of it. So like if I go to the OpenAI website and I'm chatting with it, it'll just keep pushing everything into the context window. Each of the questions and responses will go in. When you use an API to access it, it doesn't do that. Um, each one is a brand new one to it. So you have to build that on your end to put the history into each call to the um, LLM. So I had to create a quick history model um, that would be the memory. So this is gonna take the prior questions and just keep adding them together. Um, and again, this is an area where you'll want to think about how many tokens you're having. And so how this is set up is that it has a max number of tokens. If it goes over that, then it will use um, ChatGPT to summarize and then push the summary into the memory. So let's say my last chat with my chatbot was 1500 tokens long, which goes over my max that I'm allowed to put into this memory. Then I have it send that out to ChatGPT, shrink it down and put it back in. And here again, I could choose any model name. I could just go ahead and change that to any model name. Um, and this shrinking doesn't take much. It's a small call, but, um, and it only happens if the query plus the response are more than a certain number of characters um, or of tokens. So, it, but then basically you're putting that then into chat history and you're gonna dump the chat history into the context window along with your rag information. And then that's what forms the background for each time you put in a new query into the chat bot. Yeah, at first I didn't realize that and I was wondering why it had no memory. And then I realized that, oh, when you do API calls, you don't have the memory feature built in, unlike the others. Um, yeah, so I'm saving it to memory and then that's all set. Um, yeah, then this is the beginning of the prompt. So I'm setting up um, the prompt. So it's going to have a chat history and it will know that it's chat history and then that will follow. It will have um, the follow-up inputs will go into the question and then if it's a standalone, it goes there. Um, I'm telling it to only answer in English 
So I put it up here though, when you call for the answer template, and then it will fill in to the template. Yeah, we're getting to the end now. Um, now this is kind of the chain of things that happens when I retrieve it. So this pulls all these pieces together now. Um, and as you can see, it's using for this then, um, having it use Gemini for each of the model names um, for the actual LLM queries that we're doing. And I have the temperature set at 0.8. I could set it at anywhere. Um, yeah, there's a number of variables in here, but probably more than people want to get into. But you can play with any of these and kind of see then how it works. Yeah, and then this is just kind of the ending parts of the interface. Um, And this is where I added the part where it says, which document is it pulling primarily from? So as we saw when I asked the question and then it gave one, now where it kind of, well, it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors is, all I have it doing is pulling the, the document from the chunk with the highest cosine similarity. But I know that's not necessarily the only place it got its answer because I gave it 10 or 15 chunks back of information and it used all of that. So it's only telling you like, out of the document with the highest cosine similarity, this is what that document was. It's not actually saying that's also where I got my answer. It got its answer out of everything. It doesn't even know like which chunk well, it didn't get it out of one chunk. It got it out of all of them kind of combined together. Um, so it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors. And my guess is it is so with perplexity too, that they're doing pretty much the same thing because how else could you? You can't, unless you're only giving it information from that one document, it's using other stuff, whether you like it or not. Um, but that's the document that had the highest cosine similarity score chunk in it. So that's why I'm saying this is probably where it came from, but it could be wrong because it could have taken the actual answer out of like the fifth and sixth chunk for whatever reason, um, if they're all fairly similar. I, mean, I don't know, maybe it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, so that was it. That's what I wanted to show. Again, all of this is open. I will post it. You can, I mean, you can go to Hugging Face to my account and get to it already, but you're welcome to borrow, steal. It's all borrowed from other places primarily anyway. Um, but I think it hopefully is interesting as you start to think about uses of RAG to start thinking about kind of the complexities of the decisions. Um, in the fall, there's also a package I want to talk about once I played more with called um, DSPy, which actually does like prompt improvement stuff for you in an automated way, which I think is going to be able to add a lot more um, usefulness. Like you'll be able to get to a much better response even when people put in not so great prompts, um, but it does it in a kind of a unique automated way. Um, but too much for today. So I guess it'll have to be the fall. Yeah, I think that's it. Any questions online or, oh, I see there's something in the chat, but oh, going to another meeting. Yeah, I'm gonna stop the recording. There's also a question that Oh, okay. Just let me stop sharing.